Greetings, my brothers and sisters. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you to our first Bible study since the coronavirus began to impact us in Jamaica. We welcome in a very special way those who are watching us via live stream. It is our hope and prayer that the Lord will be gracious unto all of us in this difficult season and help us to navigate through these uncharted waters. It was our intention to have live Bible studies on Thursdays, but due to circumstances beyond our control, we will not be able to do so. However, we will provide you with Bible studies every Thursday. The only thing is that it will be a recorded study and not live. We are teaching from the book of Ephesians. Our overall subject is the sovereign God and the mystery of his will. We are now on lesson 28, and our topic for this evening is joined together in Christ. And as usual, we will be reading Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, and we'll be reading from the New English Translation. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision that is performed on the body by human hands, that you were at that time without the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, the one who made both groups into one, and who destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility, when he nullified in his flesh the law of commandments in decrees. He did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by which the hostility has been killed. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So that through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we stand in your presence. Lord, we realize that if you do not help us, we will surely fail. You are our help. You are full of all wisdom and knowledge. And Lord, you are the only one who can make a difference in our lives. We pray that tonight we will not so much hear the voice of a frail, vulnerable man, but the voice of Almighty God. We commit this study into your hands and we give you all the glory for what will be accomplished in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the second half of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, the Apostle Paul focuses 
on the work of Christ for the Gentiles in particular and on the reconciliation of the Gentiles and the Jews in their union with Christ. According to New Testament scholar Daniel Wallace, the theme of this section of Paul's letter may be stated pragmatically in the following way. Christians get along with each other, maintain the unity which Christ has effected positionally by his death in a practical manner. So what Paul wants for the Ephesian Christians to do is to live out in their lives in a practical way what Christ has already positioned them for. And this is what he wants those of us who worship at the Grace Workshop to do. Before they were saved by God's grace, the Jewish and Gentile members of the Ephesian church had been separated by what Paul referred to as the middle wall of partition. This middle wall of partition may have been an allusion to a literal barricade which separated the court of the Gentiles from the temple itself in Jerusalem. But the allusion to that barricade was by way of illustration. What Paul was actually speaking of was the chronic, deep-seated hostility that existed between the two groups. The divine ordinances given by God to Israel stood as a wall between the Jews and the Gentiles because it made a definite distinction between them. Jesus Christ destroyed this middle wall of partition when he abolished the law by his death on the cross. By fulfilling the demands of the law in his righteous life, and by bearing the curse of the law in his sacrificial death, Jesus removed the legal barrier that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. Paul informs us that our Lord did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. Christ not merely made one man where formerly there had been two, but he made one new man. He created something entirely new. The old distinctions between Jew and Gentile have been lost in a new man, the in Christ man. In verse 16, Paul continues and expands his explanation of the purpose of Christ's sacrifice, whereby he abolished in himself the law of commandments in ordinances. He says, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by which the hostility has been killed. Paul is referring here not only to the reconciliation between the Jews and the Gentiles, but also to a reconciliation that is even more fundamental, namely the reconciliation between lost humanity and God. In the context of the idea of the reconciliation of the Jews and the Gentiles, Paul introduces the larger idea of the reconciliation of both groups to God. While it is true that both groups had been in a state of enmity with each other, the larger and more basic truth is that both groups had been in a state of enmity with God. Indeed, it was because of their enmity with God why they were at enmity with each other. It was God's purpose and plan to bring the Jews and the Gentiles into a right relationship with himself and with each other by the cross of Christ. 
on Calvary, he put to death the enmity between the Jews and the Gentiles by putting to death the enmity between both groups and himself. In this way, he reconciled both groups in one body to himself and to each other. The idea of peace between God and man and consequently also between man and man as a result of the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross is continued in verses 17 and 18. Paul says, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near so that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. The peace of which Paul speaks here is not a feeling, but an objective fact. Every genuinely saved person enjoys peace with God right now. The fact that the Jews and the Gentiles have been brought to God through Christ is a witness to the truth that Christ came and preached peace to both of them. And because both the Jews and the Gentiles have obtained this peace through Christ's suffering on the cross, both groups now have access in one spirit to the Father. It is through Jesus Christ and him alone that access to the Father was made possible and real. We may define access as it is used by Paul in his epistles as the freedom to approach the Father in the confidence that we have found never-ending favor with him. Access has to do with the special status of those who can enter boldly into the innermost dwelling place of the sovereign God. Both Jewish and Gentile believers can now, as a result of Christ's work, walk together as one humanity into the very presence of God. I hope you are beginning to see the implications of this for us at the Grace Workshop Ministries. It is by means of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that the saints have access into the presence of God. The indwelling spirit opens the door into God's immediate presence. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ reconciled both the Jews and the Gentiles to God through his suffering on the cross. And both groups have access in one spirit to the Father. Since this is the case, all inequality between the two groups as far as their position or their standing in the sight of God is concerned has come to an end. Paul gives expression to this truth in verse 19. So then... You are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. In verse 12, which we had looked at earlier, Paul had told the Gentile members of the Ephesian church that prior to their conversion, they had been alienated from the citizenship of Israel and were strangers to the covenants of promise. But now, no longer were they to be considered mere foreigners who happened to be visiting the people of another land, nor were they to be regarded as aliens or sojourners dwelling in the midst of Israel without having obtained the full rights of citizens. On the contrary, they were now fellow citizens with the saints. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. The church is not to be divided into first class and second class members. 
Every member of the body of Christ is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They have all been separated from the world and consecrated to God as his own peculiar possession. Their position and standing is also the same. They were all chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. They were all predestined to the adoption as God's legal heirs through Jesus Christ. They have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. And all of this was and is according to the pleasure of God's will and to the praise of the glory of his grace. In the latter part of the verse, Paul expresses the truth of the change that has occurred in the circumstances and standing of the Gentiles in an intimate manner. He declares that they are now members of God's household. Earlier he had said, you are now fellow citizens, but now he says you are members of his household. They are now a part of God's family. The household is a more intimate unit than the state. A family member shares a more intimate relationship than a citizen does. Brother and sister are more endearing terms than fellow citizens or countrymen. We are all brothers and sisters in the one family, no matter what racial, national, societal, economical, or physical distinctions we may possess. In verse 20, the apostle changes his metaphor from family life to architecture. He tells the Gentile believers in Ephesus that they have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In this verse, Paul refers to the apostles and prophets as the foundation upon which the believers, both Jewish and Gentiles, have been built. This appears to contradict 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11 where he says, for no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. So here he calls Jesus Christ the foundation. But it is precisely because the apostles and prophets gave such a faithful and spirit-empowered testimony about Jesus Christ that they could be called the foundation of the church in a secondary sense. Paul does not refer to them in and of themselves as the foundation, nor does he do so because they were entitled to this distinction as a result of any intrinsic merit that they had. He does so because they were divinely appointed witnesses and ambassadors who were constantly pointing away from themselves to Jesus Christ. In Revelation 21 verse 14, the Apostle John uses the same symbolism in describing the New Jerusalem. The wall of the city has 12 foundations and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The term prophets here does not refer to those who exercised that office in the Old Testament, such as Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc. Rather, it is a reference to the prophets of the New Testament era. In referring to our Lord as the cornerstone, Paul clearly gives him the preeminence over the apostles and prophets. 
Historically, the cornerstone was the most important part of any building. It was the first stone laid for a structure with all other stones laid in reference to it. That's very significant. All the other stones were made to adjust to the cornerstone. Therefore, the cornerstone determined the position of the entire structure. The cornerstone was also the key to keeping the wall straight. The builders would take sightings along the edges of this part of the building. If the cornerstone was set properly, the masons could be assured that all the other corners of the building would be at the appropriate angles as well. The total weight of an edifice rested on this particular stone. If it was removed, then it would cause the whole structure to collapse. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the spiritual house that God is building. I want to say that again. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the spiritual house that God is building. He must be the first stone that is laid and every other stone must be laid in reference to him. If he is laid correctly, then all the walls of the building will be properly aligned. One of the problems we are having is that Jesus Christ is not the cornerstone of many churches. They are built upon men. They are built upon rules that men have originated in their own minds. Many churches, I am afraid to say, do not have Christ as the cornerstone. And so the walls are all askew. The whole building is not aligned properly. They are aligned on men and not on Christ. Again, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the spiritual house that God is building. In addition to resting upon him, the character of the spiritual spiritual host is determined by him the character of the host is determined by him its strength and security is dependent on him it is jesus christ and jesus christ alone who settles the question as to what this house is to be in the sight of god and as to what is its function in the world, it is Christ who gives the house its direction. In 1 Peter 2.5, the apostle Peter refers to believers as living stones. Christ is the cornerstone. And we who are stones that are laid in the building are living stones and the living stones must regulate their lives in accordance to the will of the cornerstone jesus christ the importance of jesus christ as the cornerstone of god's spiritual building is stressed by paul in verses 21 to 22 he says in him in him, the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. The building that Paul refers to is of course the church, the mystical body of Christ. He explains that in addition to being the principle 
of the church's stability and direction, Jesus Christ is also the principle of its growth. There are churches that are growing, but Jesus Christ is not the growth principle. Some churches have adopted an attractional model. They attract people to Christ. They tailor their services to meet the needs of people. And the services is, are not tailored to glorify God. And we have what we call seeker-sensitive services. And the only seeker in those services is God. Because an unsaved person in their natural state does not seek after God. The only seeker is God. If we glorify God, if we plan our services to glorify God, he will meet the needs of the people who come. Christ is central to the growth of the building. Christ is the one in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. The words being joined together are the translation of one Greek word which means to join closely together. The members of the body of Christ are not only joined closely with Christ, they are also joined closely together with each other. It is in union with him and with each other that the entire building is growing. In union with Christ and in union with each other. That is how the building should grow. It cannot grow appropriately and biblically only through union with Christ. It has to be in union with each other. It is a living building consisting of living stones. In fact, let me say that if the building is growing in a accordance with its union with Christ, it will automatically grow in its union with each other. Each living stone, whether he or she be Jew or Gentile, slave or free, rich or poor, black or white, makes his or her own contribution to the growth and beauty of the building. Each stone, each living stone has a contribution to make. That is why we must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because each stone has a contribution to make. There is no unimportant stone in the building. The church is God's temple we are persons who were once enemies, are not only joined together, but are contributing to the growth of each other because of their union in Christ. I need you, you need me. We at the Grace Workshop Ministries need to understand that we cannot make it without each other. God has designed the church so that each member is dependent on the others. Paul underscores this point in chapter 4 and verses 15 to 16. But practicing the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head. From him, from the head, the whole body grows. Listen to this. Fitted and held together through every supporting ligament as each one does its part. The body builds itself up in love as each one does its part. 
The word temple is a translation of a Greek word which has reference not to the outer area of the temple with its porches and outbuildings, but to the inner sanctuary. Paul is not speaking here of the visible church that congregates on a Sunday. The church as it is reflected in the membership records. He's speaking of the true ecclesia, called out ones, the invisible church. It is this group that he refers to in 2 Timothy 2.19. However, God's solid foundation remains standing, bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from evil. Paul's reference to the temple would most likely have been meaningful to both the Jews and the Gentiles in the Ephesian church. The Jews would have thought of Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And the Gentiles would have thought of the great temple of Diana or Artemis in Ephesus. Both of these temples were destined to be destroyed. But the temple that God is building will last forever. The Holy Spirit builds this temple by taking dead stones out of the quarry of sin, giving these dead stones life, and then setting them as it pleases him into the temple of God. He is the one who digs out the stones. He is the one who places them in the body after giving them life, and he places them in the body as it pleases him. This reminds me so much of what occurred when the temple of Solomon was being constructed. In 1 Kings 6 and verse 7, we read the following. As the temple was being built, only stones shaped at the quarry were used. The sound of hammers Pickaxes or any other iron tool was not heard at the temple while it was being built. The stones before they were fitted into the temple had long before been dug out and shaped. Before we were fitted into the church, the temple of God, God had already elected us and predestinated us. He had cut us out of the quarry in his eternal mind and he had shaped us. So when he fitted us into the church, we were ready a long time ago. The living stones are being built up together, together, not individually. The living stones in God's temple are not built up individually. They are being built up together in the closest possible association with each other through active fellowship. And even now when we are not able to assemble together, we can still have fellowship. We can have phone fellowship. We must call each other. We must interact with each other. We must remember to pray for each other. We must text each other. I am saying that I have just gotten a cell phone. Some of you are excited about that. Pastor has gotten into the 21st century. The emphasis on the word together clearly indi indicates that the temple of God must not be understood in terms of individual believers, but in terms of the whole body. 
made up of Jews and Gentiles together in Christ, Paul's emphasis is on the corporate dimension of the church, not on the individual believer. Brothers and sisters, God has not only saved us individually, he has also made us a part of his church collectively. Jesus died to make reconciliation possible. You and I must live to make the message of reconciliation personal. The Apostle Peter puts all of this into perspective in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. And I'm going to read it. So, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and precious in God's sight, you yourselves, as living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it says in scripture, look, I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. So you who believe see his value. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are God's people. You were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. As I close, brothers and sisters, it is very important that we see in these references to God's household, a building, a holy temple, and a dwelling place to God, we must see in all of these references our church the Grace Workshop Ministries, made up of radically different people who are living out our lives amid the pressures and conflicts and enmities of everyday existence. We are the body of Christ, made up of real people who were accustomed to give vent to our prejudices and biases and enmities in specific social, cultural, and even religious ways. Now, by the grace of God, we are making an effort to intentionally, concretely, and experientially break down the walls of division that exists among us as we are being built up together in Christ into a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Can we do it? Yes, we can. And we will by God's grace. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Once we were dead, once we had no hope, once we were strangers and aliens, non-citizens, now, Lord, we are alive. We 
are not only citizens, but we are members of the household. We are sitting around the family table with you. We are breaking bread together. Once we were stones that had no value, but now we are living stones cut out of the quarry and fitted into this wonderful building that you are building. And Lord, it is your intention that we understand that every member is important. Just like every stone, every brick in a building contributes to the overall strength of the building. So it is that every member of the Grace Workshop contributes to the strength of the Grace Workshop. If one brick, one stone, one block is removed from a building, just one, the entire building is weakened as a result. Its strength and solidity is compromised. So it is, Lord, in the body of Christ. Oh God, we pray that we will all understand this. In the name of Jesus, help us to understand this, Lord, so that we can love each other and realize that all the barriers have been broken down. There are no first-class members of the Grace Workshop, no second-class members of the Grace Workshop, no big ones and no little ones just broken vessels all of us that jesus christ is mending help us to be aware of this lord help us to appreciate it help us to love you and love each other and build each other up we commit ourselves into your hands in the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen.